name is Ian Trask. Uh, I'm a sculptor um, based here in Brunswick in the Fort Andros building. Actually, my connection to Maine started when I was a student at Bowdoin College, where I studied biology. But after two years of lab work, um, I changed course. I started to gravitate more towards making art and doing it in a very serious and deliberate manner. Um, and in that transition process, I actually had a, sm a short stint as a groundskeeper at a hospital, and my job every day was to pick up garbage in the parking lot and did picking up trash daily. I got really upset at, you know, my fellow humans and how irresponsible they could be. And that just sort of lit the fire that inspired me to start using waste in my work. Um, and conveniently, it's this sort of infinite free resource. And being an artist without sort of a, a lot of money or technical skills or like educational background in it, it, it's just, it gave me this thing where I could start off from and just really dedicate my time and my energy. And over the years, it's ballooned not just from this sort of personal exploration of the trash I find in my own life, but a collaboration with my community when they give me the materials that they find and give to me, hoping that I can find a better use for it than they will. So here I am with uh, an art kit inspired by my work. Um, and today I'm going to try to figure out how to make a few spores from the materials provided inside. Um, so it looks like we have a collection of fabric samples. Um, I love using fabric samples because there's so many different colors and textures and it actually compresses really well as a material. Um, there's some more fabric. Here's uh, the thread, um, the material I'll use to, to bind the spores. Uh, the fishing line, which is a little tangled right here. Um, and then these look like some sort of uh, plastic templates that objects were cut from. This one might be a little tricky to turn into a, a tighter object, but I can show you a way in which I might try to do that myself. Um, here's more instructions. Postcard, more string. Okay. Um, I'll try these first. Um, so what you notice here is that there's some holes already cut out. So if I wanted to string a bunch of these pieces together, I could use the existing hole here and run a string through it. Um, but what I would want to do is get a, many of these little objects on the string itself. So if I cut this plastic down and try to leave as many of these individual openings as possible, sometimes you might need to make a hole on it yourself. Um, in that case, you might need an extra tool, but that's a little more advanced, I guess. This is like the boring how the donuts are made behind <laughs> the scenes, you know? Like sometimes when I have a bigger spore and I have like a massive collection of things like it could literally take me all day to prepare the material yeah. or to string the material. Like one day, one time someone gave me a collection of beads that they no longer used and I just strung all the beads together including these like tiny little beads that like took me eight hours and I had like a bead chain that was over 30 feet long, you know. Um, and then the spore that came out of it was maybe only about, you know, as big as a softball. Open up a string. So if I'm trying to string it, sometimes thread loses focus. I might take a little piece of tape just to reinforce that end and then just start stringing. 
So really your goal with a spore is to make it as round as possible. Um, it's not always that easy considering the material you have. If it's not very compressible or if it's irregular or if you have big pieces like this, it, the challenge becomes and how do you how do you get that shape with what you have? Um, I've noticed some of your things you do use like plastic bags. Yes, sometimes if it's a lot of loose objects, um, what I will do is put all those objects in a plastic bag. Um, and then that bag acts as a skin that keeps all those pieces from, from falling out. Um, and it really allows you just to add shape to it in a way that you might not be able to otherwise. I'm sure I will be doing this on this one. Um, if it looks like this isn't gonna be enough material to, to make a nice round shape, I might take a piece of this fabric here, ball it up to make kind of a, a soft core that creates enough volume in the middle so that when I wrap this stuff around it, um, it has the shape I want in the end. And then you start to get the fun textures playing off one another with the color and the texture of the fabric underneath sort of the more dynamic and interesting shapes of this plastic material on top. So now, um, so that these all don't fall off, I'm gonna tie a little knot here on the last one. And you can do that just by looping it around one individual piece. So what you see, these don't have any holes in them, so I'm not gonna use them right now. If, if I had more time, I could poke or drill a hole in them and include them in this. Um, so what you'll find is if you try to take all these and compress it, if you tighten them all and try to compress it, you might not be able to get what you want. Um, one trick is to allow more slack in the string so that the pieces have a little more room to breathe around themselves. And that just allows them to stack in more interesting ways when you compress it. So I'm gonna tie this other end here. All right, so I have, I have my string here. Um, as far as what piece of fabric I think would look good with it, I think I'll go with this one. Um, so what I can do is I can kind of, the trick too is to not start too tight. You kind of want to leave room to have it compress as you put the string around it. Because if you start too tight, it just, it doesn't always work properly. Um, so now I take sort of this loose collection of fabric and plastic pieces you want to put in some work in the beginning to shape it with your hands. Um, this can be harder if you have small hands, um, which I imagine many of you do. Um, and then I guess I'll keep going with the green string for consistency. Um, so you can start by tying this end somewhere onto the piece itself. That way you don't have to hold onto it. So I kind of have to start over and you try to want to get these like fun pieces equally distributed around the perimeter of this piece. Um, then you just you take take your string here and just start to just pull in all the pieces. Be patient at first because it's not going to immediately look like it's working, and the tendency might to be frustrated that it looks loose and kind of sloppy, but I always find it only looks right at the very end and that's because you dedicate a lot of energy and patience into just pulling everything in and making it as round as possible. And not just going as quickly as you can, but taking your time and being very deliberate about where the string lands and how it's working with the material. And it's okay to pull it nice and tight, but don't pull too tight or you might break your string. 
If you break your string, that's not a big issue. You just tie those two loose ends together and you keep going. And again, every time I go around, I sort of spin it in my hands and just kind of, does it look a little bit rounder than it did before? Um, and then you just, you know, you want to make sure you're kind of like getting it into the valleys of this piece. And like when it's in the valleys and you pull it tight, it's when it really just starts to consolidate and get the shape that you want. And one thing to pay attention to is you're not just doing the same motion and just overlaying the strings in the same direction all the time. You really want to keep moving it in your hand and getting the string as well distributed across the surface as you can. If you get a knot and you can't get it out of there, it's okay. Just wrap it in, work it in, then you won't even notice. So now that you're at the end of your string, um, what I do is if you have a pair of pliers, not everyone does, but you can try to find a spot close to the end of your string where you have a bunch of other strings overlapping one another, and you can try to thread it underneath, pull it tight, go under that same spot another time, and then tie a knot. And then with that little loose piece, you can kind of find a hole or an opening in it and just try to tuck it away. And then you're left with your spore here. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples of how I might use materials to create these and some items you might find in your home. Uh, here's an example of an old Matchbox collection that someone gave me. Um, so you can see all these cars. I didn't know at first how to bind them all, but I found that I can use plastic bags as a, as a skin to hold it all in. So here's a bunch of cars in a plastic bag, which I've then bound with yarn. Um, here's actually a similar process with bottle caps. Um, in other cases, I've actually put holes in all the bottle caps and strung them on a string and then put them together. Um, here's an old stuffed animal. Here's, I mean, everyone has stuffed animals in their house. Eventually, you kind of are no longer interested in some of those stuffed animals. Here's a way to keep that as a personal memento because it's important to you, but without, in a way that is like a little more significant and fun, and you can put it out on display and look at and appreciate in a new way. Um, over here, there's a bunch of other examples of materials that you could find in your house. I have some with old wrapping paper from Christmas. You know, what do you do with all that waste when you unwrap all your presents? The tendency is to put all that stuff that you just bought fresh and throw it away because what else are you going to do with it? Um, here's an old puzzle that was missing a few pieces. You know, what do you do with a puzzle when you, it's unsatisfying to complete it and you're missing a few pieces? Some Ethernet cords. Uh, buttons, old Christmas lights, um, plastic necklaces, more stuffed animals, more textiles, and then, um, you know, Easter egg, plastic Easter eggs from your Easter egg hunt. Monopoly houses. And, and Monopoly houses. I don't know who has this many Monopoly houses, but you know, 